Well, good afternoon. Um, uh, it's great to see this crowd here, and uh, please munch, particularly during my introduction, which I'll um, uh, stretch out for a minute or two to give you all a chance to chomp down. But, but um, uh, Caroline has assured me that she feels totally comfortable talking while you chew, so <laughs> don't rush. I'm not um, chewing in, in, right, right, exactly. <laughs> Enjoy your lunch, and, um, but we will go ahead and begin, so we'll have uh, plenty of time for conversation in the group. Um, before, th this is the fourth of our, uh, actually, it's the fifth, if we include Laura's lecture that started out um, our, our series in the fall. Um, and we have one more lecture this year in the, the Women's Studies and Religion program, which will be on Thursday, March 22nd, also a lunchtime meeting in this room. And that will be Shelley Rambo's um, uh, lecture in theology. And uh, I, she just handed me a new title for the talk, which is now in, uh, titled Witnessing Breath between death and life, reinterpreting Holy Saturday. Uh, and that's on March, March 22nd. Um, it's a great pleasure today to get to introduce Caroline Johnson Hodge. Um, uh, it's really, uh, it's, as we get to this point in the year, I'm always reminded what a great job I have of getting to spend the year um, learning from the visiting research associates about their, their diverse interests and participating in the interdisciplinary uh, conversation where their work is cross-fertilizing and developing, and I get to see it in development. And it's been a real pleasure uh, working with Caroline this year and seeing some of that process. Um, Caroline Johnson Hodge is assistant professor in the Department of Religious Studies at the College of Holy Cross in Worcester. She received her BA from Pomona College, her MTS degree from HDS, where uh, some of her teachers uh, are still, still proud to have her back. Um, and her doctorate from Brown University in the history of early Christianity. Um, she offers courses at uh, Holy Cross in New Testament, Paul women, and Women in Early Christianity, as well as Ancient Households, the topic of her talk today. Uh, her first book has recently been published by Oxford University Press entitled If Sons, Then Heirs a study of kinship and ethnicity in Paul's letters. Um, and she's continuing and expanding her focus on families in, in uh, the ancient world in the, the talk she'll give today, um, which I will let her introduce. Great. Thank you uh, so much, everybody, for coming, especially on this frigid day. It's so nice to see uh, familiar uh, faces, students and colleagues, even colleagues from other places, um, and those of you who are uh, strange faces, I, I welcome you as well. Um, I'm honored to be here and to be sharing this work with you. It's um, a work in very much in progress. I'm at the beginning of this um, project, so I, I look forward to any reactions and help and insights you have in the conversation afterwards. As I understand it, I'll talk until about one, and, uh, and some people will have to leave for classes uh, at that time. Um, after that, we will have some time for conversation until, what is it, about 1.30? Is that our schedule? Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a handout um, to go around, and if there's not enough, perhaps um, people could share. It's the main passage that I'm focusing on today um, from 1 Corinthians. So my, my talk is titled, Married to an Unbeliever, Households, Hierarchies, and Holiness in Early Christianity. In his advice to the bride and groom, Plutarch famously pronounces, Quote, a married woman should therefore worship and recognize the gods whom her husband holds dear, and these alone. The door must be closed to strange cults and foreign superstitions. No god takes pleasure in cult performed furtively and in secret by a woman. These comments represent a larger 
uh, patriarchal ideology that the wife, along with the whole household, should follow the worship practices of the husband. It also suggests the possibility that this counsel was not always followed and that wives or other household members might bring their own gods into a household, attempting to maintain ritual practices in their honor, perhaps secretly. This tension between this patriarchal household ideology and the potential resistance to it propels my current research on women and households. A number of our early Christian sources tell us that sometimes whole households converted together. The typical pattern is that the head of the household, who is usually a man but not always, is convinced by a particular teacher who's passing through town, and he and his whole ha household are baptized. This phenomenon is in keeping with the ideology Plutarch lays out. But what if a wife converts to Christianity and her husband does not? What options did she have? Did she remain in the household? Did she leave it? If she stayed, did she practice this new religion in secret, as Plutarch mentions? Or did she somehow incorporate Christian practices into the traditional religious practices of the household? Unfortunately, and not surprisingly, we do not have evidence from the women themselves about how they handled this situation. We do have evidence, however, that Christian men were concerned about wives in this situation. These texts represent a range of opinions. First Peter counsels, for example, that wives married to men who do not obey the word should not say anything but accept the authority of their husbands and hope to win them over by their virtuous conduct. The wife here becomes a mute, obedient evangelist. By contrast, the apocryphal acts cast the ideal Christian woman as a celibate wife who refuses to obey her non-Christian husband, particularly with respect to conjugal duties, which usually results in the breakup of the marriage and the household altogether. The wife here is a spunky, countercultural rebel. Tertullian, whose rhetoric grows slightly hysterical over the prospect of mixed marriages, lists some of the practical problems facing Christian wives. If you must keep a station, he says, your husband will take you to the baths. If you must fast, your husband will prepare a feast that day. How will you ever get permission from your husband to go out at night to evening meetings or to call on the brothers, to assist at the Lord's Supper, or to host a traveling brother? Tertullian articulates the crux of the problem when he comments, quote, Every Christian woman is obliged to obey the will of God. Yet how can she serve two masters, the Lord and her husband, especially when her husband is a Gentile? If she obeys a Gentile, her conduct will be Gentile, unquote. A Christian woman married to a Gentile or non-Christian, as Tertullian puts it, is subordinated to two competing patriarchies, marriage and Christianity. One of my goals for this project is to draw attention to the women's lives that are implicated in these early Christian texts. I am prompted by feminist scholars who have been calling for this effort for years and who have developed methods of historical reconstruction to fill in some of the voices lost in the historical record. As I fill out the research for this larger project, I hope to include slaves who share with wives, although in very different ways, subordinate positions in the household. Although I focus on women today, you will notice places where slaves might well be added to the analysis or places where it's clear that I've been thinking in those terms already. To say something about these women married to unbelievers, I think we need to analyze these texts not only in the context of marriage discourses, which has been done by scholars, but also in the context of ancient households and the various hierarchies and social relationships that occurred there, including marriage. This becomes especially relevant when we recognize that the household was a sacred space, at least parts of the time, and at least parts of the house for parts of the time, and religious rituals were a part of daily activities. Furthermore, these religious practice, excuse me, furthermore, these ritual practices in which all members of the household participated were integral to the power negotiations within the household. Today I will share with you my initial efforts to apply this insight to Paul's famous and famously puzzling mixed marriage passage, 1 Corinthians 7, 12 to 16, 
Did everybody get a chance to grab a handout? I don't know if there are extras. Or if it, does anyone need one? No, yep. great. <clears throat> While much scholarly attention has been given to these verses, we have not seriously considered the implications in the con- their implications in the context of Corinthian households. I argue that ancient listeners would have heard this advice in this context, both as they experienced it in their lives and as they heard debates over proper household comportment and hierarchies. Toward this goal, I will first offer some thoughts about Paul's rhetorical aims in this passage, then turn to some observations about households to highlight the issues his rhetoric ignores or silences. Finally, I will ask how mixed marriages and Paul's advice about them might have been heard and evaluated by Corinthian women. By tending to these questions within the larger context of the household, I hope to expose some of the possible stakes for the Corinthian women married to unbelievers. 1 Corinthians is a letter full of advice on various social practices, such as eating, marrying, having sex, and worshiping. In the context of these new communities, Paul views these issues as important theologically as he attempts to shape idolatrous Gentile bodies into Gentile bodies in Christ, now belonging to the God of Israel. In this redefining, self-control, bodily boundaries, and proper and improper mixing are crucial themes. This particular passage occurs within a discussion of marriage and the relationship between a husband and a wife. In the verses just prior to this passage, Paul tells those who are married not to separate from each other, explaining that this is a command from the Lord and not from him. Thus, in verse 12, Paul explains that he now gives his own advice and not the Lord's. And Paul writes, To the rest I say, and not the Lord, if a brother has an unbelieving wife and she agrees to live with him, let him not leave her. And if a woman has an unbelieving husband and he agrees to live with her, let her not leave her husband. For the unbelieving husband is made holy by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy by the brother. Otherwise, your children are unclean, but now they are holy. If an unbelieving man separates, let him separate. Neither a brother or a sister is enslaved in cases such as these. God has called you in peace. For how do you know, woman, if you will save your husband, or how do you know, man, if you will save your wife? How to manage contact with those outside the ecclesia is a repeated theme in this letter. Here, within the context of advice on marriage, Paul introduces a specific situation. When a believer is married to an unbeliever, and thus the boundary between insider and outsider gets negotiated within the context of the household and family. In studying this passage and thinking through what Paul is up to here, I have found it helpful to investigate two related themes. One theme has to do with policing bodies and managing boundaries and is signaled by Paul's use of purity language. The other theme is his overall message of this section of 1 Corinthians, which is stay as you are. In my comments on this passage, I will tease out how these two both complement and complicate each other. Scholars have long puzzled over Paul's purity language in this passage. Paul's argument seems to be that the unbelieving partner is somehow made holy by the believing partner, a process which is clearly proven through the holiness of the children, whatever that means. This logic rests on the assumption that if one of the parents were not holy, the children would be unclean. Since the children are holy, which seems to be a given, both parents must be holy also. I think it is probably fruitless to attempt to discern a coherent system of purity and holiness here, or in Paul as a whole, or in the Corinthian community, that would explain why the children are holy and how exactly spouses are made holy. Scholars have speculated that it has to do with the intimacies of marriage, namely intercourse, and that holiness was understood as heritable, so children of holy parents were thus holy. As intriguing as I find these possibilities, my current analysis will not focus on them for two reasons. One is that we simply do not have enough information to get very far. And two, 
I think it's more helpful to think about how purity language is being used rhetorically here rather than to try to uncover some stable system that existed. How does Paul deploy purity language in certain situations as he does here, and what are the issues at stake for him and for the Corinthians? If we survey Paul's letters, we find that he repeatedly connects Gentiles who are not in Christ with idolatry and porneia, or sexual immorality, and then describes this state in terms of pollution and holiness. Before they are in Christ, Gentiles are are idolatrous, prone to acts of sexual immorality, and are akatharta, or unclean. This cluster of bad things in Paul's thinking is a theological condition that characterizes people who are alienated from the God of Israel. In turn, Paul describes the transformation from this degraded state to becoming a people of God as being made holy. In fact, just prior to our mixed marriage passage, Paul describes this transformation. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, Paul gives a before and after moral assessment of the Gentile believers. Quote, those who are sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate men, are senokoitai. There I'm, I'm throwing the Greek in there instead of trying to translate this term, which is often translated as men who have sex with other men or sometimes male prostitutes. Thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, robbers. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what some of you used to be. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Unquote. Holiness marks a shift in identity for these non-Jews who have left behind their worship of the wrong gods and a lack of self-mastery and have become loyal to the God of Israel. Shortly after outlining this transformation, Paul places constraints on these holy bodies. He develops a notion of the sanctified corporate body and argues in 1 Corinthians 6.16 that those individual bodies, recently sanctified and justified, must answer to the body of Christ, of which they are all members. Using an elite man, that is, one who might avail himself of a female prostitute as his prototype, Paul challenges, quote, Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall become one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun porneia. Unquote. With Genesis to bolster his argument, Paul asserts a contagion theory, whereby impurity can pass from one to another through acts of porneia, or sexual immorality. This is especially egregious since it threatens the body of Christ, the community, to which the believer's body is connected and subjected. Paul wraps up his argument with a repetition of the relationship of the individual body to the corporate body and makes explicit the individual Corinthians' lack of power. Quote, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? Unquote. 1 Corinthians 6 thus illustrates how Paul uses purity language to define status and to limit the power of the Corinthians. Calling the Gentiles unclean links them to idolatry, immoral behavior, and the crisis, from Paul's perspective, of being alienated from the God of Israel. In turn, sanctification and holiness signal a transformation from that degraded state to a new life in which they belong to God and must live up to this standard. Part of this deal, as Paul states in 1 Corinthians 6, is that they no longer own their own bodies, but must serve the corporate body of Christ. Going back to the mixed marriage passage, we see that here, too, Paul uses purity language to define a change of status of a Gentile, this time presumably not one who has been baptized into Christ, but one who has an in-Christ spouse. In contrast to 1 Corinthians 6, however, where Paul claims that a contagious impurity threatens the body of Christ, In this passage, a contagious holiness seems to be at work. Here, the status of the believer's body 
a member of Christ, a holy temple, outweighs the status of the unbelievers, the holiness of the believers somehow transfers to their unbelieving spouses at least enough to render the children not unclean but holy. With this, rever- with this reversal, Paul, and I would say inadvertently, grants more power to the individual body to influence and transform other bodies. Furthermore, this, pos- the, this possibility of one spouse sanctifying the other has implications for the boundary of the community. How was membership in the ecclesia defined? Was baptism necessary or were there other ways to join, like marriage or having holy parents? It seems to me that Paul's use of purity language here is intended to serve his larger admonition of 1 Corinthians 7, which is to stay as you are. He offers this advice to those who are married, to those who are not, to those who are widows, to those who are virgins, to the circumcised, the uncircumcised, and to slaves. Just prior to our passage, for example, Paul advises spouses not to divorce each other. When he turns to the issue of believers married to unbelievers, he also counsels the spouses to stay together and encourage the believers to accommodate the unbelievers. If the unbelieving spouse wants to separate, let him or her go. Paul explains why, quote, God has called you in peace, unquote. Two verses later, he sums up the principle that governs each situation, quote, let each of you lead the life the Lord has assigned to which God has called you, unquote, and further claims this is the rule in all the ecclesiae. This call for inertia that dominates this chapter stands in stark contrast, it seems to me, to Paul's language of transformation in 1 Corinthians 6. He calls these Gentiles to self-mastery even, and even upholds the celibate body as the ideal for bodies in Christ Yet he turns and tells them not to rock the boat, stay as you are. Margaret Mitchell has demonstrated how Paul's rhetoric here and throughout 1 Corinthians draws upon political and philosophical discourses of harmony and unity. This rhetoric masks difference, quells dissension, and as such serves as an assertion of power by those for whom not rocking the boat is advantageous. As Laura Nasrallah points out, This conservative argument is employed by Paul in an attempt to, quote, corral various somatic practices of the Corinthian community, whether celibacy or sleeping with a prostitute or speaking in tongues, and to construct the Corinthian identity, unquote. In our passage, the potentially unharmonious issue of mixed households has been raised, perhaps initially by the Corinthians themselves, and Paul frames the solution in terms of purity and pollution. Paul's purity language by transforming the unbelieving spouse attempts to dispense with the conflict and for the sake of stability secure the holy status of the whole family. Thus the holiness language here seems to operate almost as a quick fix, serving the larger goal of encouraging sedation. I see a certain irony in this, however, because Paul has granted, or perhaps acknowledged, the sanctifying power of the bodies of believing wives. Thus, he undermines his effort to rein in female bodies elsewhere in this letter. I will return to this at the end of the paper. We turn our focus now to a question that Paul completely ignores. What would it mean exactly for a believer and an unbeliever to share a household? What would this look like? In the ancient world, marriage, religious practices, and children, the main topics of of Paul's passage, are inextricably bound together in the structure of a household. Agreeing to live together, as Paul puts it here, encompasses the whole range of responsibilities of a husband or a wife in maintaining a household, including bearing and raising children, conducting business, producing goods, farming, and tending to the household cult. Ancient listeners would have undoubtedly heard Paul's advice in this context of the household and the various activities associated with it. We'll return to the passage after we take a peek into some Roman period households. If we were walking down the street in Pompeii in the year 50 of the Common Era, 
we might catch an occasional glimpse of the goings-on inside houses we pass, especially those of wealthier citizens. We could see through the front doorway, for example, into the atrium of the house, which served as a place to meet friends and business associates. The pater familias, or head of the household, might be there, greeting guests and conducting business. We might see a slave standing guard in the doorway or passing through the shadows on the far side of the atrium on his or her way back and forth from the kitchen or work rooms. We might also see the domina, the wife of the pater familias, in her various duties as household manager, coordinating the work in the house or receiving guests as well. Depending on the house, we might glimpse a shrine in the atrium or the garden beyond, a mini temple that mimics the, the architecture of the sanctuary down the street. Statuettes of the gods might be perched inside this structure or might be painted on the side, perhaps including the genius or personification of the paterfamilias of that household. If it had been the birthday of the paterfamilias, we would have seen the household members making offerings to the Genius at this shrine, a rite that signals their allegiance to him and their membership in the household. Passing another house, we might witness the family gathered around a shrine while a mother and daughter place offerings of cakes, wine, and incense to Juno in a niche on the wall. It is the daughter's birthday, and the mother coaches her in her prayers to the goddess. In rooms hidden from public view, like kitchens or other service areas, slaves might tend their own shrines, a less decorated niche on the wall, perhaps, above the stove. In space where free elite members of the household would not have frequented, slave men and women may have honored the gods of their owners, or perhaps more likely they honored their own gods, such as those from their homeland. I hope it is clear from these snapshots, which I have drawn from, from literary and archaeological evidence, that households should not be cordoned off, as though they were private retreats from work and public life. Instead, Roman period households accommodated domestic, commercial, political, and social activities. People slept, dressed, cooked, ate, procreated, and raised children in households. People worked in households, sometimes in shops attached to the physical space of the house, contributing to the economic production of the household. People conducted business in households, as, ex as exemplified by the ritual of the morning salutatio, in which clients would visit patron patrons in atria, often on view for passers-by. People also entertained in households, inviting friends, business and political associates to dine in their houses. A wide range of people could populate an elite household, immediate family members, extended family, dependents, slaves, other workers, nurture, nurses, teachers, and so on. Crucial for all of these activities and all of these people was proper devotion to the gods who saw to their prosperity. The Roman playwright Plautus plays with the idea of the gods' control over households in his second century BCE comedy, Alularia. In the opening scene, the god himself serves as the narrator and speaks to the audience, explaining who he is. Quote, I am the household god of that family from whose house you just saw me come. For many years now, I have possessed this dwelling and preserved it for the father and grandfather of its present occupant, unquote. This lar acts as a puppeteer of the members of this domus, judging characters based on their devotion to him and then deciding who will succeed and who will fail. The God speaks highly of the daughter in the family. Quote, she prays to me constantly with daily gifts of incense or wine or something. She gives me garlands, unquote. Because of her devotion, the Lara decides that she will be the one to find the pot of gold which is buried beneath the hearth. Even as Plautus pokes fun at the power attributed to the household god, he also offers hints at what household practices comprised, prayer, offerings of various gifts, decorations. These offerings included animal sacrifice, as indicated in another play by the same author, where the head of the household, upon finding a lost daughter, calls out to his wife, Quote, 
Prepare things for me to make an offering to the household gods when I return home, since they have augmented our household. We have lambs and pigs for sacrifice at home. Unquote. As these examples indicate, religious ritual was incorporated into daily life, and it also marked special occasions. In his farming manual, De Agricultura, also from the second century BCE, Roman author Cato offers a good example of how religious practices in an elite household could operate as a site for assertions of power. While the treatise as a whole is written for elite men who might acquire a country estate, here Cato addresses the head male slave of the household and farm. One of his duties is to supervise the head female slave who may be given to him by their owner as a wife. She must clean the hearth daily and decorate it on holidays. Quote, on the Kalins, the Ides, and Nones, and whenever a holy day comes, she must hang a garland over the hearth and on those days pray to the household gods as opportunity offers, Unquote. We see similar rituals as those described earlier, but here carried out by the female slave. Cato is careful to point out, however, that the slave's role in religious rituals is limited and distinct from the roles of the dominus or the domina. Quote, she must not engage in worship herself or get others to engage in it for her without the orders of the dominus or the domina. Let her remember that the Dominus attends to the worship for the whole household, unquote. Anxiety over unsupervised religious practices surfaces in this passage as Cato outlines the limitations on the slave woman's freedom to perform religious practices. This passage offers a glimpse of the role of both a slave woman and a free woman, the slave woman performs religious duties connected to the hearth, which she tends daily, and the domina, or the free woman, is responsible for ordering and overseeing these duties. The dominus, though, the male head of household, is in charge of the rituals of the whole household. His authority trumps that of both women. This autonomy with respect to religious practices reflects the power structure of the household, which is shaped by gender and status. Cato's instructions echo the prevailing ideology of the power of the paterfamilias in the Roman household, as well as the intertwined gender and status hierarchies that order the subordinate members of the household. Yet his instructions also betray the potential for destabilizing this structure. Cato recognizes the possibility that the slave woman will initiate religious practices herself or get others to do so acts which mimic the authority of the head male slave over her or the domina and dominus over both of them. This passage, like the Plutarch passage I opened with, suggests the possibility that power relationships could be inscribed, acted out, assented to, and resisted through religious rituals. In a discussion of Foucault's notion of power, Elizabeth Castelli offers the following evaluation. Quote, what is most helpful about this conceptualization of power, it seems to me, is that it creates the possibility of agency for the occupants of the subordinate position in a hierarchical relationship. That is, rather than theorizing the powerful and the powerless, it suggests that power is multiply figured in social relationships and creates the possibility for thinking that the weight of the hierarchy might shift, unquote. Catherine Bell develops precisely this notion in her study of ritual. Bell presents a complex understanding of ritual or ritualization as an arena in which power is asserted, accepted, and resisted. Building upon Foucault's notion of bodies as sites of power, Bell argues that ritualization, as action mediated by the body, becomes a process of power negotiation. Quote, ritualization is a strategic play of power, of domination and resistance within the arena of the social body, unquote. We might read the household rituals described above, ancient households in general, as well as the literature prescribing household behavior, including 1 Corinthians, in this context. Power relationships are mapped out in each. Castelli, Foucault, and Bell emphasize that power does not operate in a one-dimensional fashion, 
exercised on those of lower status by those of higher status, by the paterfamilias on subordinate members of the household, for example. Instead, power is consensual, and as Bell argues, ritualization allows those of the lowest status to claim some power, even if their subordination is reinscribed by the ritual itself. We can imagine that through daily rituals, women and slaves of both genders found ways to resist or appropriate power in the household. Cato, Plutarch, and Paul may be responding to this possibility. With these comments about households in mind, we return to Paul's passage, this time thinking in terms of how the Corinthian women may have heard his advice. Paul glosses over all sorts of complications involved in mixed households, including how differently his advice applies to men and women. On the one hand, Paul's reciprocal language is striking and may appear to resist or offer an alternative to the patriarchal household structure. The conditions which Paul lays out in two parallel sentences appear to be the same for the believing husband and the believing wife. If your unbelieving spouse agrees to leave, to live with you, stay together. Indeed, this phrasing seems to leave open the possibility that a woman would in fact not necessarily follow her husband's gods. On the other hand, as Elizabeth Castelli has pointed out, such reciprocal language does not necessarily translate into equal treatment in practice. For a woman to leave a marriage or stay in a marriage, for example, could have profoundly different implications than for a man to do either. A husband who is the head of a household, for example, might expect that the whole household would follow his religious practices. Indeed, as I have discussed, belonging to a household meant worshiping the gods of the head of the household. For heads of household, then, mixed marriage would presumably be a non-issue. A wife in a mixed marriage, by contrast, would encounter a power structure in which she is expected to submit to her husband's traditions. She might be in the position that Plutarch imagined, accused of bringing the foreign superstition of this Jewish Messiah into the household. <clears throat> the stakes are thus much different for her than for a believing husband. Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza, who has long been a leader in reconstructing non-canonical voices, suggests that when the Corinthians debated among themselves the issue of how to live out their new self-understanding in Christ, they may have written to several teachers to ask their advice, Paul being one. Discussion would have then continued once the, letter, uh, once the answer had been received, evaluated, and compared to others. I find this reconstruction compelling because it frames Paul's letter not as the sole authoritative voice among early Christ followers, but as one of many who were subject to critique by the Corinthians. In the final section of this paper, I will lay out a series of scenarios imagining what the issues might have been for women in mixed households. Given the religious life of ancient households where offerings to the gods are made on a daily basis and images of the gods might populate the domestic space, we can understand how mixed households might be problematic simply from the perspective of logistics. It may have been difficult to avoid traditional worship practices and given that loyalty to her husband was tied to loyalty to his gods, her avoidance of these practices may have been perceived as insubordination. Perhaps some of the women shared with Paul the association of unbelieving Gentiles with idolatry, a lack of self-mastery and porneia, and thought their marriage to unbelievers constituted participation in these unclean things, taking them away from God. Paul thus solves this problem with his logic of contagious holiness, reassuring them that they can stay in the marriage without compromising their new status. In this scenario, we might ask how this gets played out. Do all these household members continue honoring the household gods, protected by the holiness associated with the God of Israel? Schusler Fiorenza suggests that Corinthian women may have understood that their new identity in Christ disregarded the social distinctions among them and even abolished old kinship and mar marriage ties. Some of the women might have thought that patriarchal marriage was no longer appropriate for them and wanted to leave their marriage for that reason. 
Perhaps some in the community agreed with Paul that a celibate body was the ideal and sought to live this out. Anne Wire argues that this is a possibility for the Corinthian women prophets who understood themselves as channels of God's abundant spirit and who rejected, quote, sexual relations that involve the authority of one person over the body of another in order to devote themselves to prayer and prophecy, unquote. These women would have thought that marriage with unbelievers was no longer viable and may have been voicing these opinions and acting on them. To each of these groups, Paul's stay-as-you-are response aims to keep these marriages intact as long as the unbeliever is willing. I think all of these reconstructions are good possibilities. My work on households and religious practices prompts me to suggest another possibility to add to these that some Corinthians actually did not find mixed household a problem and did not want to leave them. Perhaps some of the women were leaving these marriage and others were not. Instead, this latter group brought their new God into the household. Maybe Paul's emphasis on accommodating the unbeliever's wishes, if the unbeliever wants to separate, let him separate, hints at an unwillingness to break up marriages on the part of the believers. Indeed, contrary to one of my scenarios mentioned above, several scholars who have reconstructed the Corinthians' positions, Weyer, Martin, and Castelli among them, have argued that the Corinthians were, in fact, not concerned about purity and pollution, boundaries, identity, and proper gender and sexual behavior. Anxiety over these issues comes from Paul, not the Corinthians, and triggers his use of purity language. Elizabeth Castelli suggests that Paul frames his argument in these terms because of his particular view of bodies as empty containers to be filled, as potentially dangerous, as entities requiring policing. We have seen him characterize Gentile bodies this way. By contrast, the Corinthians view bodies Castelli argues, as potential vehicles for fluid for a fluid surging power, which might occupy different bodies at different times with different intensities. If this is the case, we'll just take this for a minute and go with it, then perhaps some women were unconcerned about their proximity to an idolatrous believer. We have seen how households could include a variety of religious practices and spaces, and that people of different status participated in the daily rites. Perhaps unbelieving husbands would not have even cared if the God and the Messiah of Israel were added to the deities honored at the shrine in the atrium, the more the merrier. It seems possible to me that this mixing of gods would not have bothered either spouse, or perhaps even Paul. If her husband did object to this foreign deity, however, perhaps the believing wife worshipped her God on her own or in secret. Our archaeological evidence suggests the possibility that subordinates in the household may have had some autonomy in their religious practices with opportunities to follow or subvert their duty to the gods of the paterfamilias. Plutarch and Cato seem concerned about precisely this situation. Perhaps bringing this new god into the household, then, on the part of the uh, believer wife, was a form of resistance and assertion of power. Since I'm wrapping up, I'll just keep going out on this limb and suggest that these Corinthian wives may have perceived this power, as Castellian wire suggests, as fluid, available to different bodies, regardless of gender and status, uninhibited by proximity of outsiders, their gods, and their rights. This sort of power could operate within households and destabilize its hierarchy. In this scenario, It is staying inside the household, not leaving it, that rocks the boat. And perhaps Paul has given precisely the wrong advice. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really um, fascinating. And um, we do have... You even made it five minutes early. I think we got a bit of an early start, so we have plenty of time for discussion. Uh, Yeah, I welcome your responses. Any questions? Karen. 
And that would be a little bit, that would be ironic coming from Paul, wouldn't it, um, in, a, in a way? I mean, that may be kind of one of the tensions that's coming out there. It, you know, Paul, for whom the celibacy is the ideal and marriage is almost a, you know, if you can't hack it, you know, if you're, you're going to be subject to desire and so forth, marriage is the, the sort of the net. But I can see that. I can see that um, operating in, in the sort of larger cultural Conversation about procreation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. 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 And I mean that. Yeah. 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 That's right. That's interesting. Yeah. I don't know what to do. Um, uh, and most people don't know what to do with this passage because it's the only place, I think, the only place Paul talks about children at all. Is that right? I think that's right. Um, so, but thank you for the, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay. of a child taking on a religion outside of his parents or before he or she is out of the house or is this not a subject addressed either by Paul or by other entrepreneurs? That's interesting. The the issue of whether children would bring their own gods into a household, for example, or... Yeah. yeah I don't know. That's, I can't think of a, a place... Another mention of something like that off the top of my head. I don't know if anybody else can. And, and, and I'm thinking of discourses about children's loyalty to the father through, uh, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Did you have a... Yeah. Right. Yeah. Good question. Yes. Uh, I actually, my comment, I don't really have a question. Just a Great. Comment. Excellent. I really like your uh, paper. Thank you. The way that you're reading this passage. And I think your reading is actually su supported by what Tertullian says is going on in his own Excellent, because that's who I have to do next. <laughs> yeah, in the letter to his wife, the second one, He's huh. saying that there are women in his community who are using precisely this passage. When he gave us this passage, I was like, oh. and this is what they're negotiating. Uh -huh. is these women are saying not only that it's fine to stay in mixed marriages, but that they can now, even as Christians, go and secure a mixed marriage. And Tertullian's argument that you read about, mm -hmm. well, then you won't be able to go to the Paschal celebration. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's presuming precisely this kind of religious household. Right, well, we're, exactly. Right? But we don't know that the women were making that presumption or that that was what was really going on. Mm -hmm. um, so he's sort of presuming well, that that has to be the dominant, that there's no way of sort of subverting. Of making it, yeah, making it work. So I just think it really supports what, <coughs> what you're, what you're well, saying. Well, thank you. And he, I mean, doesn't Tertullian spend an awful lot of time turning this passage into a very clear statement against initiating mixed yes. marriage? Yes. And he, so he tries to make Paul say that he's really only talking about um, w once you're already in it, right? right. Yeah. Right. And he, the whole, his whole interpretation hangs on um, later, at the end of chapter 7, where you can marry only in the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's those exactly. four words that he reads. Whatever that means, right. All of everything that comes before That's right. read through yeah. those four words. That's which fascinating. Which can only mean the sort of yeah. religious affiliation of the person. Right. 
In the larger project, Tertullian's a big, a big chunk. Okay. I, I'm starting with, <laughs> starting with Paul, but the, yeah. I feel like a fan. You're, are you a fan? You're a fan of Tertullian. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So. Well, I'd love to talk more with you sure. about what you've done on. Mar- you've worked on marriage. Um, well, I dress mostly. Uh huh. Oh, great. And you should talk to Carol, too. <laughs> she works on clothing. <laughs> yes? What translation is this? Um, it's a combination of, it's mostly me. It's a combination of me and the NRSV. Okay. I probably t- took the NRSV and tweaked it over several years. <laughs> the reason I ask is, with the translation, and she agrees to live with them? Yeah. The verb assume you go care, right? Um, I, I trans- I've come across it before, and I think it is. Is that what it is? Is it for agree? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and the reason I ask that is that if it were to, if you could translate it as it seems agreeable to live with her, then mm, the oh, that's interesting. To the, the, to the, the, the follower of Jesus as opposed to the, the unbeliever, mm-hmm. which, is, which is especially important for um, a woman. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, in speaking of the power that you were talking about going for at the end, um, if she understood that power to be within her, then and seemed agreeable, agreeable to remain with the husband and, and mm-hmm. help support that argument. Thank you. Yeah, that's interesting. And it seems agreeable. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll have to look into that. So my Greek is fantastic. So <laughs> <you know that. laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the whole the whole accommodating. What, what sounds to me so much like accommodating the unbeliever is sort of strange to read. So that would, mm-hmm. that would help that, thinking through that. Is there a question to help me? Sure. Uh, Mary. Uh, something I think would actually strengthen um, the entire background of the argument. I yeah. I'm familiar with Johnson Kwan's at BU and just the theory of the, the moral impurity versus ritual impurity. Yes. Uh, because this is an interesting passage because it seems is if the background of this is the, the moral impurity of contact with Gentiles. But if you read that tradition, it's, it's a bit more complex than that, but Paul's taking sort of a simple, a simple version of that, the background of that notion. Um, but Paul does a strange thing here because ritual impurity is communicable. Right. But as far as I know, in all of Jewish tradition, I don't know of a case where purity is, is communicable. Is communi- yeah. And so... You've got Paul taking a the, the moral impurity side of that of that uh, that aspect and running with it. That's right. And then doing a strange ritual impurity uh, sort of conflation or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which I wonder if you thought about that as a sort of an odd, either oddly metaphorical or. Uh, by the way, I think that you come closer to an explanation of that than anything I've ever heard. Oh, um, thank you. That, what um, did I explain? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just, it, it, it's so so bizarre and unusual. And, yeah. But um, so I, I mean, I, I think you're on the right track with this. No, oh, thank you. But it does. I, it fills. I think it does fill out the entire background. Yes, mm-hmm. and and in part of you know in my notes to myself uh, working on this project, um, I, I keep having these you know need to tackle whole issue of purity categories, and mm-hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with. Um, Christine Hayes, I think yeah. it's Christine, and she so she says Paul's doing something completely new here um, by mixing those two categories and coming up with a moral impurity that is contagious, and she calls it carnal impurity. Um, and uh, Dale Martin has one footnote, and I, I meant to have it available in case this came up, and I didn't. One footnote of a, a rabbinic text where purity is, where purity or holiness is contagious, or or passes from one being to the other. And that's the only one I've seen. So it is quite unusual. And so I guess my take on that has been to sort of say, well, what, well, Paul's doing that for a re, for, in a specific situation to, to serve what he's trying to, to say here, rather than to say, well, maybe rather, maybe I'm sort of resisting what, what Hayes does a little bit, which is to say, oh, there's a new there's this set purity system and there's a new component to it, I, you know? Yeah, I, I agree with you there. I think he's being sort of ad hoc. Sort of yeah, like, exactly. Like, try this on. Right, exactly. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's my sense as well. Laura. 
Um, I've got two completely unrelated questions, so you can pick one or two both if you want. Um, the, the first has to do with the state of marriage and whether marriage is a legal privilege. Uh, the comments you made at the beginning about slavery. Yeah. How do you read this par paragraph in terms of, is it just, okay, two people are together and Paul practically sees that as marriage even if it's not state or ritually sanctioned yeah. as such? Um, so that's the first question. The second question is that you encouraged us to think about what it would mean to add something to the family shrine. And although I absolutely don't believe in universal Jewish anikonism at this time period, I'm a little bit flummoxed as to what one would add to that shrine yeah. if it's next to the Roman gods or the, the local gods. I can absolutely imagine the rituals, the daily rituals, the, the practices, but I'm just stuck on a mosaic issue, which is what is the form of God? Um, you know, I've been thinking about Philippines too a lot, and I, I still can't get my head around what is the morphe to that will, yeah. and what, what that would be. So, mm, yeah, nice. um, I have no idea. Um, what it would be. I, I feel like my, my, my guess is, I feel like a lot of what I'm doing is guessing and imagining and, and playing and coming up with possibilities to kind of shake up the way I have always thought about, you know, th this period of, you know, sort of being fairly well bounded. And once you were Christian, you were Christian and that sort of thing. So um, I, I don't know. I, my sense, though, about the as I learn about the um, ritual practices of the household and, and otherwise, that there was a, enough sort of um, um, flu fluidity among them and variety among them that there there would have been a way to honor God, you know, honor the God of Israel. I mean, maybe what what is that? The later passage um, is it in Justin about the wife with a cross or something? What am I thinking of? <coughs> I'm sorry, I, I don't. I don't know what text I'm, I'm thinking of, but there's something about a woman doing. She's the worshiper of of the one God, and she's doing some ritual practice in her home. And this is very, a very considered very suspicious by the um, by the non-Christian, you know, head of household. There, I, I'm going to have to to dig up the text. But so I don't know, and I hadn't thought that far when I was sort of playing with that idea of bringing something to add to the shrine. I have no idea. Um, as for the marriage um, and, the, and the issue of what marriage is, I also um, am not sure. I have, I have framed this discussion other times that I've written it and presented it as Paul is speaking to those who have the privilege to marry. So I guess I was thinking more in terms of a legal situation, but I think I was just making that assumption. I mean, part of Part of my question as I do this work is thinking, well, how, how do slaves fit in here? And can I plug slaves? Is, is Paul thinking of slaves when he's writing this? Is it possible that he had, you know, or was he thinking of elite? Who is he thinking of? You know, and, and um, so that's all stuff I'm still sort of working out. Do you have any ideas about who he's talking to or what I, notion of marriage he has here? I mean, I'm, I'm always torn on the question, well, the, the separability of the question of Paul's intention yeah. and the question of the right. reception, first of all. Right. Second, I'm sort of influenced by the idea, you know, Steve Friesen's argued about the poverty level of, mm -hmm. of Paul and community. So if we think of this as fairly poor, even though we know it starts with Chloe's household, yeah. um, <coughs> I just, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I'm, yeah, I too am pretty yeah. flummoxed on, on mm -hmm. the issue. It seems to me that a slave conceivably could hear herself in in this language, um, especially if I think almost all the terminology is really Hindi and Adelphos mm. and sort of flexible. Right. It doesn't say, if you have been married according to the Lex Julia, right. <laughs> right. Proceed, you know, right, 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 right. Um, but I was just wondering yeah. you know, if, if we do read this through the slave woman's lens, what? what exactly, is. yeah. Similar questions. Yes. Um, you were talking about um, purity and impurity. I think that for contagious and specifically for sexually contagious in the way and the creation of children, um, and the children be characterized as holy. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. 
My understanding is that at this time they would have understood that, well, there were actually debates about the degrees to which each parent contributed to the child um, and that, that the classic understanding was that the, um, you know, the, the woman gave the stuff and the man gave the form to it, you know, and that, of course, is hierarchalized. But then you get Galen, who's after Paul, saying that actually both of them contribute a seed um, and, and people debating that. So that, that's an interesting idea you have, you're thinking in terms of whether they, they may have been thinking of sort of physiologically. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly yeah. The the right. One of the things that, one of the way, the connections I make with um, that, that idea is, is the notion of when Paul talks about receiving the spirit in baptism and how it's a, the spirit is like a, a material thing that transfers from Christ to, the, to their bodies and thus affects a, a material change in them. Um, at least that's, that's how I read it. And so I was, that's kind of what I had in mind. It was kind of a, um, a physical transformation that would take place at baptism. Um, so I was kind of thinking along the same lines, but thinking in terms of the pneuma instead of in the physiological process. Any other questions? Well, let, please join me in thanking Carol for a wonderful <laughs>